Oops. Oh. Hello. Okay. So, um, just a moment, I'll share the screen. I want to show these screens here. They basically show from 2009 to till 2017, the change in internet access from desktop versus mobile versus tablet on a worldwide basis. And you see it started, when we started with pocket code, it was very low part that was gone through these uh, mobiles. And if you look at, so now it's uh, already more mobile than normal internet through PCs. And if you look at countries like India, because we are very interested in this whole aspect of poverty alleviation. And in India, you know, there are like uh, 300 million people who have almost nothing. So we were thinking about such countries especially. So here you see the same statistic more or less starting in 2010 here and also till last year. Uh, first of all, one thing, Tablets do not play any role, almost. And mobile access to the internet is uh, around 80%. And you have like, uh, yeah, around 20% standard internet. And the trend is very clear. So when we started in 2010, it was not clear at all that it would behave in that way. There's one more statistic here you see also in 2010 operating system market share, Android was practically zero in 2010. Now it's going to 40% and that includes everything. And you see iOS is more or less stable. Android is still going up. Uh, I'm not saying anything about, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not, uh, initially when we started, we also developed a version for Windows phones because we wanted to be, to make it platform independent so that kids from, that have smartphone, any kind of smartphones would be able to access it. Of course, in the meantime, we have stopped that. But yeah, uh, as I mentioned last time, our iOS efforts, which we started in 2012, also quite early. Finally, now we have one version that we uh, tried to upload to iTunes last, uh, last week. And uh, since then we had a lot of back and forth between Apple and us. And yeah, it's, it's not so easy. They are still not accepting us. On the other hand, Google is very welcoming. They have, um, they, they have uh, helped us a lot. Just this week, they decided to sponsor again uh, this Google Code In event, where, which is oriented towards teenagers from 13 to 17. It's a worldwide um, event. And we have been chosen among, I think, uh, like uh, 27 organizations and we will be able to give a prize to one of the participating kids and they will be invited with their parents to two kids they will be invited with their parents to the google headquarters next june so this this is also something that might be of interest to you let me see if i can show it to you here do you see still my do you see my screen yeah Yes. Yeah. So code in with Google and here, uh, yeah, they're, they're the prices. So we are one of the organizations. And one thing that you see here also is Catrobat has a new logo. This black cat with the bat wings, that's the new logo of Catrobat, which was designed also recently by one of our long-term design contributors. So- uh, I, I see it. Operating system market share worldwide. Is that what you're are you talking? Is that what you think you're sharing? Oh you yeah, maybe maybe I didn't share the right. Okay, because 
okay, let me just continue with this, okay? Because okay. Uh, we have I the graph. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you have the okay. graph. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the same graph for India, and here you see iOS doesn't even appear. Yeah? So just to explain that uh, for, for India, uh, you are going now to 80% Android for the all operating systems, and that includes, of course, companies and adults and everyone. So it's really, it's really uh, very dominant. Um, yeah. So now let me check if I can stop the sharing. Yeah. So now I'll try to show you a few of the things directly on my phone. So I'll share. Do you see my phone now? Yes. Okay, good, so I can. Um, perfect. So uh, Pocket Code, the first screen looks like this. And it's, yeah, i show you a few programs. Um, so here, for instance, this is a small program where you have to cross the street with the frog and you can move around and there's a fly and you need here a little bit more of energy, you see, to cross the road. So you can try to catch the fly and then you get more energy. And that's typically something that can be uh, created here uh, using this, this uh, it's very similar to Scratch actually, right? So then I have enough energy and then I can, you know, try to, okay, it's a little bit dangerous. Ah, okay, didn't manage to do that. Um, so, um, yeah. This one here is a kind of high resolution game that uses the, the physics engine. You, so each time this ball touches the walls, there's a slight vibration. So you feel it in the phone. And also the, the movement of the ball is simply uh, done by the movement of, of the phone. So depending on the inclination of the phone, it will, uh, it will move the ball around. Use like this. Yeah, I can show you also with the camera. So I have to hold it like this and then, you know, move oh. it around like this. Yeah. So this is typically something that you can only do with the, with the phone because otherwise yeah, you cannot have these uh, sensors. So now let me show you how to do such a thing in a new way. And I'm sharing the screen again. So I'll make a new program and I will call that, um, yeah. Eloisa, so, no, it doesn't, oh. Somehow it's Chinese, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, wow, this is interesting. Chinese keyboard. So let's try this. Yeah. So I'm just creating. Uh, I saw that when you, uh, you could choose any kind of cellular, any kind of phone, yes. Samsung. Uh, oh, it adjusts for the type of the phone you have. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. So here we have now our own predefined, um, you know, characters that we can use. So for instance, if I choose the penguin here, uh, then I can just have this as one object or character or sprite, like in Scratch. And here then I have the scripts, the looks and the sounds. 
But if I execute it by pressing here at the bottom on the play, then it will just show the penguin. And I can of course also change that. So we have here a complete image manipulation program with all the possible, you know, like uh, tools and all the colors that can be used. Let's say I want to, to make the pe penguin pink here, then I can do that. And I have also things where I can draw at a different place than where my finger is positioned, if you see that. And yeah, it, it can do many, many things in that way. So I'm, I'm going back now. And by the way, yeah, I can turn that also off so it doesn't show the details. So here now, this is like scratch. So one of the things is I can change the size, for instance, then it's simply smaller when I execute it. And now the new thing compared to scratch is that we have special bricks for a, for a physics game engine that is included. And here you see this in the motion category, there's this set motion type. And if I keep it like that, set motion type to bouncing with gravity and I execute it, it will fall down and become faster and faster, uh, like you would expect. And then it's very similar to scratch, but of course, I mean, there, there are some differences, like here, for instance, that the forever brick and the end of the forever brick are not connected. Yeah, that, that's something that we want to change and that's why we uh, we were now in the US for this cooperation with the Scratch team uh, because we want to have a, yeah, we want to take advantage of their code. So here now, if I do that like this and I execute it, what you will see is it will bounce from the wall and it's moving now as an object that has been automatically cut out correctly even though it's simply a, an image. Yeah? It's just a PNG and the physics engine automatically has uh, uh, computed the contour of this penguin. And if I, if I change that in some way, let's say I make, um, do like this, yeah? and I execute it, then those new elements will also bounce the, the horns, so to say, of this penguin or the ears. They will also be active as uh, borders that will, um, yeah, that will bounce, for instance, from the walls. And the previous games, the, the game that I showed you with the, um, with, with the uh, um, maze, with the ball that was exactly like this. So it's very simple actually, sorry, going back to the script. Yeah, it's very simple to uh, have an object move very naturally. Now, uh, one important thing. Often, how do you, uh, which menu you, menu you use to sense the movement of the phone? Yes. Uh, by the sprite or yes. I said the yes. Wrong. yes. So, uh, um, Heloise's question was how do I make it move in such a way that uh, it moves according to the inclination of the phone in the two uh, or three dimensions in space? Yes. So, that's it. Exactly. So, here we, it's obviously it's related to motion also because I want to have it have the penguin move in a certain way. And here at the bottom, there are all kinds of bricks that are related to this motion type with the physics engine. So here you have uh, normal velocity, you have an angular velocity, which is so and so many degrees per second yeah, here. Um, but I will not use that here. Um, and 
And then very important is you can set the mass, you can set the bounce factor and the friction, but most important is this gravity vector because that allows us to say in which direction should it fall. And the default is, you see that the y value is minus 10 steps per square seconds. So that is the standard value. And if I keep it like this, it will do exactly like before. But if I want to, uh, to, to move it like the ball before, according to the inclination, I will have to put in some formulas here. And now this is another big difference to scratch because we don't use bricks for the formulas. Uh, the bricks for formulas in Scratch take a lot of horizontal space. And since we don't have that, and we were initially thinking that our main target audience would be teenagers, we were always thinking, okay, it's not so important to have formulas, mathematical formulas in the form of bricks because everyone is used to writing things like five times six and then press on compute and it will do the computation and also using uh, for instance, uh, yeah, the parentheses and all those things. So it's, it's not something that is as difficult to understand as the bricks themselves, the command bricks. And of course, that's a compromise. It's also very nice to have the bricks for formulas, but it was one of our decisions to use a kind of pocket calculator instead. And of course, here, if you go on, on functions, you will see you have all those typical mathematical functions. And under object, you have all the characteristics of the object itself, for instance, the position. And logic, of course, is, you know, the standard logic and comparison operators. And then device, that's where all the sensors are located. And here you have, for instance, the inclination x. And if you press here on compute, you see the value change depending on how I hold the phone. Yeah? So I can see immediately the results. And since the phone has a high resolution, if I want to have some uh, real impact, you know, I will have to change that a little bit to make it a little bit bigger. So I'll multiply it by 10. And then you see it has much higher values. Yeah? So here, the, the inclination will, uh, inclination x times 10 will be used for the x uh, vector part of the gravity. And here the same for the y inclination also times 10. And times 10 as a positive number means that uh, the penguin will move like, like a, like a helium balloon. Yeah? So you see it will move up. I will just sh show that here. Can you see that? No. Oh yeah, a little bit, right? So if I turn it, it will just fall, fall up uh, like a balloon. So let me go back to that. So, and then I can do things like, um, react in a certain way, for instance, here, when there's a physical collision with something, in this case, for instance, the walls, then I want to have a slight vibration. So uh, I can put that here. And one second, of course, is much too long. So I can put something like this. Then milliseconds. And then each time it bounces, I feel the phone vibrate for, uh, for a short moment. So this is the way, this is the, the whole script here. And then, uh, yeah, there, let's see, what else can I show you? The rest of the bricks are very similar to what you have in Scratch. So there was this now with the physics engine, um, but there's, there are a few new things. This brick here is quite interesting. It, it says, if there is some condition that becomes true, then do something. 
And this doesn't exist like in such a general way in Scratch, but it exists in Snap. And we got this idea from the Snap uh, project. Many of you probably know Snap also. Uh, this is a very nice idea because it allows to simplify many programs instead of having forever loops that have to repeat everything all the time and check some conditions. You can have such a very simple brick that says when something happens for the first time, then do something. So this is kind of nice. There are also some other similar uh, small bricks here in the control category. For instance, wait until something becomes true or yeah such things now one really important thing that we introduced is uh, the concept of so-called um sorry it's in control it's um exactly starting and continuing scenes. Yeah? Scenes are like different projects in Scratch, but you can transition from one project to the next and then it's just having several scenes. So you can say here, I want to have a new scene. Yeah, scene two is okay. And if I go back now, you will see the program which I called Heloisia now has two scenes. This scene one is the one that we created before. It has its own background and object. And if I go back to the overview, I have now a second scene, which at the moment only has a background, but now I can, you know, make my own drawings here and just, just have separate scripts and separate um, objects and everything. And the only thing that will connect them is if I use this kind of start scene two. So for instance, if I say here, instead of this, I say uh, when the screen is touched, then start scene two. So I can delete this here. So when the screen will be touched, then the second scene, which I, of course, I can rename those scenes and I can change the order also. So when I'm here, I can just, you know, change the order like this, but I will leave it for, for the moment. So when I execute that now in the second scene, it will ask me, should it start with the first scene or with the current scene? And I start with the first scene. So here we have now the penguin. And as soon as I touch the screen somewhere, it switches to the second scene. And then I can have something like, um, okay, if this scene, unfortunately it's, it's still called here when program starts, I want to change that so that if, if it's in a scene, it will say when scene starts. But what I can do here now is let's say, I want to wait for some time, like let's say two seconds, and then it should oops, it should automatically continue with scene one again. Continue is something else than start scene. Continue means it should continue where it stopped before. So when I do that and I start again from the first scene, and now I tap the screen. After two seconds, it should be again at where it left the first scene. So this is really a, a powerful new concept compared to Scratch, I think, which allows to make much more complex uh, games. And we have some uh, some kids that create games with with like thirty different scenes, because you don't have to think about throwing away things and stopping scripts and all those things or hiding stuff. It's just taken care of for you. One more thing for the scenes is that global variables can be passed from one scene to the other. So only the global variables are shared among the scenes. So yeah, 
now um, yeah now I think Maureen is going to start to using cell phones <laughs> <laughs> yeah let me show you a few more things one is here uh, explore that's something like the scratch website we have here also all the programs that, that have been uploaded uh, and you can download any program if you go to some web page let's say flash huh? first of all i can see description normally there's also some screenshot but in this case it's white uh, i can even look at the code here already and it will say when program started turn flashlight probably on this is not working 100% correctly. You see there's also the missing image, but it means that the program will just turn on the flashlight of the, of the, uh, of the phone. Um, yeah, and then you can have comments and all those things, typical things. So, and here there, there's also something interesting. You can also look at the remixing graph or download it as a project or program into pocket code or download it as a APK, as an app for Android. So it's also possible to create real Android apps out of the project. And then going back, of course, kids can also upload their programs. That's the bottom option here. May and I make a question please yes yes uh, you, you said that uh, they can create the project and make it independent of the project like a in the temp independent app and is it possible to share this app to a friend for instance yeah yeah it will be on the page and it's um, executable on on android it's possible to install apps that are not coming from the App Store. Of course, there are some security considerations, but it's, it's possible to share the link to it. If you are on the page, uh, let's see. For instance, a uh, student uh, make a very interesting project and the other wants to play with that. Yes, so he can, you see here the link, if you press that, the link, to the program has been copied and then it's possible to share it through the normal ways. You can share this as a kind of, let me see if I go to some browser. So this is then the, the page in the browser. Oh, great. It's the same page. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And here under help, there's lots of information, step-by-step uh, -step programs, tutorials, MOOCs, starter. There's a whole education website. There's a discussion platform. So there's a lot of, they're actually on the education platform. There are lots of resources also for educators. So, um, yeah, we have here all kinds of resources and uh, here also under no one left behind. That was a big project that we did with the European Commission and some partners in uh, Spain, UK, Germany. And here you have all kind of information, for instance, for teachers, uh, curricular, uh, pre prepared materials and many other things. Actually, they wanted us to prepare a version called Create at School, which is has additional features for schools like learning analytics and also um, some ways to, to control accounts for classrooms. At the moment, it's a little bit dormant because we uh, we had this funding from the European Commission 
and uh, I think to develop it, we need a little bit more. There must be some more investment. So at the moment, we are not so much focusing on that because we don't have the resources to do it. We actually we want to concentrate on pocket code and and to make pocket code even more useful for kids themselves. So let me go back once more. One more thing that I want to show you is in pocket code here at the top right, there are the three dots here. And if I press them, I will get options. And there are two important things here. One is the scratch converter. So if I go on this now, today it works. Last weekend it didn't work <laughs> somehow. So here it works. So here I can actually search for any kind of scratch project. Eh? So if you have, so, I don't know, if you like, for instance, the Swedish band ABBA, eh? I'm sure you can find many ABBA programs and then you can try to convert that. And here it's really possible to find any Please try again later, okay. Anyway, I'll try to convert that. Cannot download. This seems to be old. Okay, this is not a possible program to, it's, this is still beta, yeah? but for many cases it works. For instance, uh, let's say, these are some sample pro project. I, I think they all would work. So I'll just try this, hope it works. So here you have a, regular program from scratch. And if I press at the bottom on convert, then it will be added to the queue because this takes some time to convert. And after some time, it will be possible to find it. You will get some message that it has been converted and it will be included here. Beatrice would like to ask something. Go yes, on, Beatrice. Please. And uh, there's a really, really interesting also from phys physics teachers, I think is a really good resources. And uh, what I want to ask is about uh, variables and database. Is, is possible to have a database on web? Okay, the question is about the uh, access. Like, you know, like, uh, um, up in Ventures, is possible to have a database on web? Also, yeah. a server. So yes, yes, yes. So, this is a very interesting question, and uh, I I had last week a hangout with uh, two developers who want to do that exactly in the same way as App Inventor. Um, so, a RESTful API that allows to access HTTP uh, hmm. resources, but it's not yet here. And I can guarantee that this will make huge problems for Apple eh? because they are totally against such powerful <laughs> things. I think we'll have no problem at all with Google incorporating that. And I'm a little bit wondering how, because uh, I, I saw that there's now a company that is using the App Inventor code and is building also a system for iOS. Yeah? It's a commercial company. I'm wondering how they will deal with this, but that's not our problem. But yeah, we want to do that. I don't know if you have heard about the Net, Nets Blocks uh, project. It's an extension for for Snap, which is fantastic. Eh? It can do so great things. It can, for instance, it, they they have added blocks that allow to access uh, the web services from Google. For instance, Google Maps, yeah? and you can import some part of the worldwide map from Google and include a specific part and then uh, have this as a look in the program. Yeah? And it's very fast, it can update very fast, so it's, it's really nice. Um, yeah, so we are always looking for new ideas. They are also an open source project, so it's easy to check how they did it. <laughs> and yeah, 
actually I'm meeting them probably in, in two or three weeks uh, and we'll try to see how we can join forces to make this available to kids. Yeah? So I think it's really nice to have this. But at the moment, we don't have any variables that are on the web. So it's all purely contained in the app itself. So I can show you a few programs that have been converted. Uh, this one here, for instance, is a, is a program that was made with Scratch and it's just an animation. Can you hear it? Okay. So it's an animation cut between Frozen and Star Wars. Yeah, it's very nicely we made. Can see, but not here. Ah, not here. Okay, I tried to. Do you hear it? Mm, not really. No. Okay, anyway, it plays, okay. The, yeah, uh -huh. it plays the Star Wars music, the typical <laughs> Star Wars music. <laughs> and it's very nicely made and it's, it's uh, automatically converted. So here is another one that is a kind of quick drawing program. It also has music and it just very quickly draws something. It's made with scratch, but you see, it also works very nicely when it's converted. And it has a very nice music with it. Sorry, you can't hear that. So this is kind of, I think very nice. If the program, if the original Scratch program had some bricks that react to the keyboard of the computer, then we will automatically translate that into new objects. And these new objects react when they are touched. They send a message that says key arrow up was touched and the object has as its uh, look, it looks like the key on the keyboard. So it's not very, I mean, it's not very nice actually, but it allows to easily refactor the program, change it, exchange the keys by sensors or, you know, whatever ideas the kids have. So that, that's a very useful thing. And try to convert in from uh, scratch. <laughs> yeah, you're trying. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's an ongoing thing. The the one problem that we have at the moment, why many pro projects cannot be converted, is that in Scratch, what you very often have is uh, this color matching. Yeah, one color matches another color, and you know, but we have different collision detection mechanism. We can detect whether one object touches another one or whether they bounce and such things. But the, those two sensors from scratch, which are super important, eh? <laughs> and no, <laughs> we haven't implemented them yet. So all the programs that use this, will you can convert them, but they will not work. Yeah? So this has to be, of course, this has to be solved. Yeah? And this is very high on our list. Of, of things that we want to do. And there's another thing that I absolutely... Excuse hello? me, uh, Evans has to go, so okay. he's saying something. Oh? I think the mic is off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, I really liked your presentation. I, I, I really like especially the, the way you integrated the sensors of uh, of the smartphone, which uh, really makes me think of plenty of applications. So uh, I'm going to start uh, no longer than today with uh, this kid here. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. See you. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll show you one more thing that I forgot. Um, we have very nice uh, extensions 
which allows to control various uh, various external objects. So if I go again here on the three dots, more options, oops, wrong, like this, uh, in the settings here, not at the, at the top language, I can change the language because many phones are restricted in the way what language you can set. And here you can set all the languages into which the program has been translated. For instance, my phone here, it doesn't allow me to change the language to, I don't know, uh, Korean probably works, but Hindi is not possible to set automatically. So here I can change the language to Hindi immediately. And then of course I have to know where to change it back, but yeah, that's like this. So this is especially useful for languages like Kiswahili, which is used in Africa in many countries because no phone uh, supports Kiswahili out of the box and we can do that. So we uh, support also uh, some fringe languages with many, many speakers, yeah? like Urdu for instance, but Google is not supporting Urdu. Uh, so then here we have Lego Mindstorms NXT. We have the EV3. So for instance, let me show you this. If I turn this on, then here at the bottom, I can say which sensor is um, connected to which port and I can select out of a number of uh, known sensors that are compatible with the Lego Mindstorms EV3. So here, for instance, I have this yeah, touch sensor, for instance. And if I go now back and go back to my previous program here in the second scene, for instance, I will have here now additional Lego bricks that allow to control the motors and play the sounds and uh, set the status of the LEDs. But additionally, I also have here under device all these additional Lego EV3 sensors included. So I can now use this as one of the sensors to, deci to decide whether to do something. And the fantastic thing with the robots is that since the phone is so small, it's possible to put the robot, uh, the, the phone on the robot and thereby give the, the robot a face. And not only a face, we also include a speech recognition so here, there are special bricks and the sound, which allow to record a spoken answer, um, spoken question. In a variable. And so, and also we have the, the speak uh, bricks themselves. Yeah? So we can say something and then um, wait for an answer and react according to what is the, what the answer was as text. And we also have something interesting, uh, namely the here under the device, we have not only multi-touch, but we also have face detection. So it's possible to detect where the face is can show this also. Now I'm moving the phone in front of me so that the numbers change depending on where my phone, uh, where my head is compared to the, phone, the phone's camera in front of it. And this allows you to program the robot in such a way that it turns to someone, moves closely. I can also uh, use the size of my face here, face size. So you see it will, if I put the phone far away it becomes smaller and if I come nearer and nearer it becomes bigger and bigger. So this allows the, the, the robot to detect how far am I from a person and if I see someone I can start talking or if I see it's not central then I can turn the robot. So all of those things make it really nice. I'll show you later maybe some YouTube video if you're interested that allowed to see that. So then other 
other this, this features make it totally different <laughs> from everything else. It's so yeah. much interesting. I yes. have no idea. Maybe uh, let me interrupt a little bit to show you the video, okay? Sure. Um, I will just switch to my browser and then I can also show you where you f can find that. So, is it here? So here, oh no, sorry, I have to change that. Uh, yeah, this one. So here, this is the website catrobat.org. Catrobat is the, the big uh, organization that does all this. And if I press here on contact, then I will be at the bottom. And here, among others, we have the link to our YouTube channel. So if I press on that, um, and here I have the videos and the playlist. So I will go on videos. Let me see that. Yeah, here, for instance, there's one that shows. Uh, Oh, let me, uh, let me see. This one is nice. So this is, so it tries, this one moves towards the face that it sees in front of it. And also the, the eyes are animated in such a way that it looks as if it always looks towards the person, you know, in front of it. Yeah, it just shows this, but this is also an old version. So, did you get the sound now also that was playing? Hello? No. I no sound. Not. Ah, okay. No. Somehow I cannot yes. transmit the sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, by the way, here under playlists, there are many, many videos, um, YouTube videos created by our users. And they, uh, there are many, for instance, there are many videos uh, created by uh, Brazilian users or um, Russian users. So for the Brazilian, where is it? Portuguese, yeah. So here you have lots, many, many videos created by fans from Brazil, I think most of them, yeah, so very nice. So this is also a good resource in many, many languages because what we found, what really makes a big difference for all these block-based languages is the is the possibility that coding can be done in the language of the of the users. Yeah? So I think this is really something that makes a huge difference, especially when we see how popular we are in certain regions where English is not commonly spoken, like in Russia or China or Japan and these areas. Yeah. So going back now to the interface again. A few more of the settings here. So we had the Lego Mindstorms. We also have a control for Parrot AR, which stands for Augmented Reality Drone. So that's really a flying drone. And if you turn that on, you can say how high can the drone fly and you have all these special bricks then for controlling the, the drone. So if I go here into the object and the scripts, then I'll have now special drone bricks that allow to 
you know, take off and yeah, emergency uh, drop and many other things. So it's really a drone and you can uh, get the video from the drone through Wi-Fi. So in that case, the drone is not, uh, the, the, the phone and the drone are connected through Wi-Fi and the drone can be away up to 200 meters and you can have the two cameras from the drone um, brought to the screen as a, as a kind of, uh, yeah, uh, as the normal way to see the look of the drone, of, of the object. So that's one more extension. And then we also have Arduino bricks. NFC, near field communication is also included, which actually is kind of interesting for certain IoT, Internet of Things application or maker uh, things. Raspberry Pi as well. So Raspberry Pi in our case works through Wi-Fi. Arduino works through Bluetooth. And that allows also many, many interesting application. I will show you also afterward uh, one thing that was done with the robot and Arduino. It's really crazy what the people are doing with it. And then there are also some other robots, Firo robot. And also it's possible to use Chromecast. And now we are working on a new project which is inspired by the Turtle Stitch project where we will ex have another extension that allows to, uh, to create patterns for embroidery machines, for stitching machines. So this is very exciting and it's actually a funded project that starts in next week, in actually in October. Uh, next week is the kickoff and we are working together with a company that sells uh, t-shirts and they they are interested in this so yeah kind of fascinating thing so the the idea here is that you can like in turtle stitch you can create you know uh, andrea is a member of our group too Do you yeah, know? yeah i know her i know her very well yes yes she, she, so so i wonder if he, she was with us today but yeah, but she knows us very well and she, you know, we are always in contact and she helps us a lot for this project because they got so much information already about stitching. But I'm always thinking, looking at the statistics that I showed you at the beginning, most people all over the world and especially young people, they don't have PCs. Yeah? So I think this this decision to, uh, to really take advantage of the phones that the kids already have that solve so many problems uh, that you normally would have if you would have to rely on PCs because the, the kids and the schools, there's simply this infrastructure problem that makes it difficult for, uh, to, to be sure that everyone will have the correct hardware. Whereas luckily, by chance, it simply became the case that uh, kids nowadays already have this hardware. Yeah. Oh, this is also one interesting application, this GPS test Hohenheim. Yeah? Someone from Hohenheim, which is in Germany, asked me whether it's possible to use pocket code to make some geocaching pro projects. And uh, I tried it out and actually it's not easy yeah? because this here now, it will always show a point in the direction of Hohenheim in Germany with the compass at the top, yeah? depending on where you point it. And additionally, it will show the distance here at the bottom here, which is where I am approximately 500, uh, 500 kilometers away. 499.7 kilometers and yeah so and it also tells me here the precision so at the moment we are like 20 meters precision it's not bad and I'm I'm currently at the height of 409 meters above the ocean so to say so this is my place here in Austria and the the 
yeah, the, the, it points. So this allows them to make geocaching pro projects. Actually, I'm in the building, so the GPS re reception is not that good. Outside, it would be much better, and then it would be possible to uh, to how can I say to 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 have a higher precision. Yeah. I'm not sure, but the 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 way to calculate the distance is not simple. Eh? It's really a kind of complex formula where you have to use a lot of trigonometry to calculate the correct, uh, you know, from the from the uh, longitude and latitude, the distance. This is not something that is obvious. It's not enough to use Pythagoras to compute that. Uh, excuse me, my moment. Uh, yes. Let's open for some questions. I'm sure that people want to make a lot of questions before you go on because it's it's wonderful. It's so so much Thank stuff. You. So let's, uh, uh, Maureen, you would like to to. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So please go on. Well, my first question is: Are you going to make an extension for microbit? Okay, micro bits, we have looked into it and I actually have bought three or four micro bits. I'm very interested in them and it seems not complicated because it has already built in Bluetooth and it already has built in um, a firmware that allows to access all the inputs and outputs through Bluetooth. So it should be quite simple. The reason we haven't done it is because we simply do not have yet the capacity. Yeah? So that's the, the main issue. I want to do it, we have the hardware, but we don't have the developers. So if someone volunteers to do it, wonderful. We are open source, so <laughs> anyone can contribute and make that extension and we would be very happy about it. Yeah? it I think it's not complicated and, but if I, I was always uh, comparing the popularity of Arduino versus Raspberry Pi versus Microbit. And the, the popularity is simply that Arduino is like 100 times or even 1000 times more popular than, than Microbit. So at the moment, our focus was on Arduino and Raspberry. Yeah, yeah I, I do feel because of the price point, it's becoming much more popular in the US anyway. Because yeah. it's cheap. And it's we can true. afford yeah. it. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. It's it's fantastic for maker scene. Right. Uh, I I think I think it's really good. But there there are other ways to um, program micro bits. Yeah. There there are several uh, similar projects that allow to and I think also the Scratch project also has now yeah. some plan to support it. So we I mean, at some time we will get there. I don't know how much time it will take. <laughs> one of the things that, I, yeah, one of the things that I want to do next, besides the color matching, and also one more thing is the user-defined bricks, which are in Scratch and Brick, uh, and Snap. We want to support the two, and we actually do it already. But um, there were some bugs, so now we have to re-implement it, unfortunately, and. Um, one more thing, and when we have those four things, yeah, the, the color sensing bricks, the two, the functions, I mean, the, the user defined the bricks, and the last thing is to be able to place objects not only with the x, y coordinates numerically, but also with the finger. So these are the four things. Once we have them, I say we have version 1.0, okay? <laughs> okay? Until then, it's still much. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but at the moment, I'm really excited about this embroidery machine because we see so much fascination from people about this. And actually there are lots of such machines out there also in Fab Labs and maker spaces. So it's really affordable yeah? and it's possible to do. And the fantastic thing is t-shirts. Yeah? <laughs> you can have it on your T-shirt. Which what what else can you do with codes? Yeah, with code, uh, normally yeah, you have it in a computer, you have it in a phone. But this is something you can wear. You can put on your rucksack, on your shoes. Yeah? That's fantastic. Yeah? Thank you. 
So, Someone King, would you like to, to talk something? Uh, one good thing that it has the Korean version, isn't it? Okay. I knew the uh, Professor Slani. We met uh, four years ago, <laughs> five years ago. Yes, he visited in Korea. So uh, he showed the uh, excellent work uh, about pocket court. So uh, I I see the uh, pocket court linear version. Yeah, uh, today so it's very very uh, interesting and many development about uh, EV3 or Arduino. So it's very amazing work for his education. But uh, unfortunately, in Korean, uh, Korean teachers select the uh, pocket code because it is not popular in Korean. So, but it is very useful for kids uh, using the smartphone. And so it's very, uh, very, very amazing and exciting works for kids' education. But I think uh, in Korea, uh, parents don't like to use uh, their kids' use, uh, smartphone. So uh, we are focused on uh, uh, personal computer or tablet, so um, more than smartphone using. So in Korean situation, uh, it is very uh, 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 different than other countries. So Korean parents uh, like uh, use the PC more than smartphone. So I think uh, the pocket uh, about the pocket call, uh, Korean people uh, don't like uh, scratch or entry. Uh, so we have the educational strategy for kids uh, because uh, you know parents don't like to use uh, their kids' uh, smartphone. So um, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Rani choose the educational strategies. For example, uh, make the educational material for kids or uh, for school or for teachers. So I, I know the Professor Han. Yes, yes. Professor Han. Yes, yes, make was... the, and try to the educational material for Korean teachers. Yes, yes. yes. He, he was here for one year now at my department. He spent a yeah. sabbatical in Austria. Yeah. 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 So, it's very, yeah. I, I mean, I, I know those uh, issues, especially with, with schools and smartphones. This yeah. is an ongoing process. Yeah? Like, yeah. like, like uh, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago, computers were not allowed mm -hmm. in school right, right. So, and it's changing the smartphone actually it's it's a computer right? there's no big big difference there's only the mm -hmm. size and yeah but but one big difference i think is that smartphones are personal devices versus mm -hmm. computers in schools or even tablets in schools are not personal devices yeah. so the the phone is something that is the property of the kids and they can do with it mm -hmm. whatever they want and they can use it everywhere yeah. at home while they are yes, right, right. So, yeah. so that makes a big difference I think and then yeah. as you have seen with the, with the robots there are suddenly possibilities with the phone that don't exist mm -hmm. with with um, you know with uh, uh, with with PCs or tablets let me show you one more thing here uh, the video that I mentioned before, which also shows very nicely. Um, I'll just turn off the phone because it's uh, the sound. So this allows, you see here, there's a, mm -hmm. there, someone here connected the Arduino and this mm -hmm. robot. And there are some sensors here in this globe 
and there is here pocket code, which mm. contr all control this uh, robot through the movement. Part is with inclination of the phone, part is with the finger movement. So when I use this, you will see it changes the color of the lights and you can control mm. the robot in such wow. a way. Yeah? And I think that's, that's really crazy. Yeah? And you can't do that wow. with a PC or with... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this... Yeah. Okay, this is a very powerful idea for smartphone and connect the robots. Yes, it, it's very useful for kids or for parents. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, of course, yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's with the phones and, and parents and schools, that's always a problem. I know there are few countries like Italy, for instance, uh, I mm -hmm. heard in Italy there, there was some initiative by the government to allow the use of phones in schools. But still, I think it's even, you know, there are still parents who are opposed to it and they're, there, there are many things going on, like in Europe now we have this whole discussion, who is responsible for the content that is uploaded to websites because there are terrorists and other bad people who upload bad things. And of course, yeah, this is also, we also have our sharing platform like Scratch huh? and anyone can upload anything. Huh? So I hope we will not be responsible for that. <laughs> Yeah. And in schools, it's, it's even worse yeah, because you cannot control what gets uploaded. And we had this problem already in the past that uh, then some teachers contacted us and said, oh, there, there's some inappropriate content here. Please take it down. Yeah, and yeah of course. <laughs> but it's very difficult. Yeah, please. Maria? No, no, no because in the scratch, the scratch team, is working a lot on uh, control uh, what uh, is published. So it's really a big... Uh, see, I think, I don't know how many people is, uh, are working on. Uh, they, are, they are paying a company. They're paying a company uh, to do uh, that. But it's only in English and it's only for text. Okay. So everything that is in pictures or that is in other languages. Uh, yeah. I didn't know, can, huh? Yeah, and it's also dangerous. It's dangerous in the sense, at least in the past, it was like this. If a, if a company or some institution like the MIT says, we are moderating this. Yeah. Then in Canada, for instance, they are also liable to really do this correctly. And if something slips through, they can be charged, they can be, you know, they have to pay fines and all those things. So it's very dangerous to say that they are moderating it. So they are doing it, but they are not saying that they are doing it. Eh? Okay. And it's, it's also almost impossible to do it in all languages, in all pictures, mm. in the sounds and so on. Eh? So, so the, I think terrorists will always be possible. Uh, they, they will always have the possibility to communicate and use this, misuse it. Eh? But I think we shouldn't have this control, the good aspects of this technology. It's a, it's a pity. Let's see how it works out. But this uh, decision by the European uh, Parliament, uh, I think one or two weeks ago was very bad. Yeah, so we'll see. Could be that, yeah, I don't know yet how we will handle that. <laughs> if it happens that we will be responsible for the content that yeah. is at the moment, we have one way to um, to tell us that there's that someone suspects some inappropriate content, and then they can flag it, and then we'll take it down, and someone re will look at it, and if it's okay, we'll republish it. But it's a lot of work. Yeah. Okay, I think we are run out of time, uh, but we. Have a wonderful session. I want to thank you so yeah. much. Very thank you. Do you want to say something, Patrick? Uh, and, 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 and I mean, I, I am very interested because I can see how we can exploit this uh, thing in the school. I know in Italy, uh, there is 
different opinions about uh, if we can use or not use. There is only a school in Italy that uh, forbidden completely uh, <laughs> this uh, the phone and this uh, last week uh, appeared on the newspaper uh, this uh, school uh, locked uh, this train but uh, I use it uh, mobile in my in my lesson for GeoGebra is coming from always from uh, Austria. Thank you, Austria, for this really, really interesting uh, software. And, uh, but uh, I, th I think the more, uh, more uh, students are uh, used to, to use uh, mobiles in class and less is dangerous, I think. But always there are the they need to have uh, a really um, uh, clear task. They, they, I mean, the, the, the didactic should be very, very clear. That is the problem. I think the, the solution is to make it so fascinating and interesting yeah, sure. that the other things are not competing. Mm, yeah. not, not, but yeah. that, that, that's a challenge. <laughs> I think the mic is off. Yeah. Ah, you can no, hear it's me? On. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, the big problem is uh, really if they have um, the problem the multitasking is not uh, they uh, they um, not, not digital uh, natives they are not um, uh, multitask it's not real that they are multitasking so you need uh, to be very strict on the time uh, in this time you know you have to, to give me the, your task so the design of the lesson is really really more complicated than the frontal lesson so <laughs> yeah and it's also not the same for all the kids some of them you know they're very different yeah, so there is no solution for everyone <laughs> So thank you very much. Heloisa, also thank you very much for organizing it. Thank and you. you can ask me anytime also, you have my contact. I'm sorry, I'm not um, very active on Facebook, so I'm not really, <laughs> you know, sometimes I find, oops, someone sent me a message three weeks ago. So better email, okay? Better yeah. email works better for me. Okay, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, thank, thank you for many. Oh, yeah, I'm very you. happy to see you. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.